Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Lecture Series. Sit back, get comfortable, and let's go see what they have for us today. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once more to another program of the Peninsula Seniors. I'm delighted to be able to have Dr. Joseph Wagner back with us. He's not only a physician and orthopedic surgeon, but a Civil War historian. And our program this morning is going to be about Dr. Gatling's great invention, the Gatling gun, which is a device that's used even to this day in, almost, in all of our military organizations, whether it's be, it be on land, uh, on sea, and in the air. And so, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Joseph Wagner. Good morning. Thank you, Marty. On April the 9th, Sunday morning, 144 years ago, Robert E. Lee surrendered his army to Ulysses Grant. At long last, after four terrible years, the Civil War was over. Instantly recognizable is this young officer with his long yellow blonde hair. He is, anybody? Custer. Custer, George Armstrong Custer. 26 years old, he made general at the age of 23, the youngest general in the Union Army. This officer is Colonel Eli Parker, a full-blooded Seneca Indian from the state of New York. A qualified law school graduate, he was not permitted to write the bar examinations deemed ineligible because he was considered not an American citizen. Another 60 years would pass, 1924, before the United States Congress enacted legislation that would consider all American Indians henceforth as American citizens. When Lee saw Parker, he reacted with outrage and indignation, thinking that Grant had intentionally brought a Negro officer to witness the surrender as a personal affront to Lee. After a moment, realizing that Parker was in fact an American Indian and not a Negro, Lee said, well, I see we have at least one real American here. <laughs> and Eli Parker, to his eternal credit, said, General Lee, sir, we are all Americans. The surrender took place at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. In Washington, the Army marched down Pennsylvania Avenue to the White House, and bands serenaded President Lincoln. The bandmaster stepped up to Lincoln and said, Mr. President, if you have any favorite tunes, the band will be happy to play them for you. And Abraham Lincoln said, I have always liked that tune, Dixie. And so at the request of Abraham Lincoln, the United States Army Band played that rousing, rallying, marching song of the South, Dixie. As you heard, I'm Dr. Joe Wagner, now retired after many years in private practice in my field of orthopedic surgery and teaching at UCLA. I also had a faculty appointment at that fine Southern Medical School, Southern California that is, <laughs> the School of Medicine at UC Irvine. And I'm a member of the Los Angeles Civil War Roundtable. Now on to the main feature, the Gatling gun. Two questions about the Gatling gun piqued my curiosity. The first was about uh, the inventor of the Gatling gun, Dr. Richard Jordan Gatling, always referred to as doctor. Was he a medical doctor? Did he have a busy medical practice? Where did he find the time to invent the Gatling gun? And why did he invent the Gatling gun? The second question was about the Gatling gun itself. Firing 600 rounds a minute, it could, with a few sweeps of the gun, wipe out an entire regiment of advancing infantry in a matter of seconds. For the Civil War, this was truly a weapon of mass destruction. So why did it not bring a quick end to the war? We'll see the answers to those questions this morning. Well, the first place to visit to see a Gatling gun is the Gene Autry Museum of Western Heritage in Griffith Park. If you've not been to the Autry, add it to the places of uh, a list of places you must visit. It is one of America's national treasures. And in their armory, you will see this post-Civil War model of a Gatling gun. Another recommendation is to take a pleasant drive down to San Pedro and Wilmington, home of the great port of Los Angeles, and visit the Drum Barracks. And in their armory, you'll see this pristine example of a Gatling gun. If you are in the infantry and the order is given to advance, there are a lot of things you don't want to see, and this is certainly one of them, the ten barrels of a Gatling gun. Oh, by the way, does anyone here own a Gatling gun? <laughs> well, that is a silly question, isn't it? Where on earth would you go to buy a Gatling gun? 
Well, actually, today the answer is easy. You go to the Internet. So let's go shopping on the Internet. Here's a good start. For only $58.97, you can buy a complete set of Gatling gun plans, top quality blueprints, step-by-step -step instructions on how to build it, a list of materials and sources where to buy them. Now, if you're not a hobbyist and not mechanically inclined, but really would prefer to buy a completely finished Gatling gun, uh, before I go on, I want to make a disclaimer. What I'm going to show you was taken directly from the Internet. I did not create any of the text or audit or edit it in any way. I did not create any of the photographs. So let's continue shopping. Remember, these are their words, not mine. In a hurry to start shooting, this one is for you, a fully finished Gatling gun. 100% finished and complete with carriage, mounts, and wheels. Arrives ready for use. Thoroughly test fired prior to shipping. You need only uh, give them the address of your local, friendly, fully licensed gun dealer and send them your check for $10,900. It's less than half the price of a Toyota and you'll have your fully finished Gatling gun ready to start shooting. <laughs> that little pricey? Well, let's keep shopping and see if we can do a little better. Well, here we are. Here's one for only $9,000. It's true it's only half scale and it only fires 22 caliber bullets, but do not underestimate this Gatling gun. It is a deadly weapon capable of firing over 700 rounds a minute. Still a little bit too small, too diminutive for you, too much like a toy. Well, maybe you'd like to buy one for your little boy. Now, isn't this just the cutest little guy? When he goes rabbit hunting at 700 rounds a minute, he can bag a lot of rabbits and probably take out a couple of his playmates along the way. Only in America. What a country. <laughs> well, now that I've told you where you can buy a Gatling gun, on the advice of legal counsel, I must caution you, firearms are dangerous. Any attempt to fire a Gatling gun without proper training and instruction can be hazardous to your health. By way of this illustration, let me take you now to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania in July. Not July of 1863, but July of 2005. There will be some comments from bystanders in the background, so listen very carefully for the very last comment. Fire in the hole! Oh, we're not loaded yet. <laughs> and we hope we're loaded. I actually got that though. The chest no. hairs are burning. Smoking! Yeah, what did I tell you not to play with toys? <laughs> yeah, chest hairs are left. Jimmy, you alright? I'm good. Huh? Well, now I've told you where you can uh, buy a Gatling gun. I've told you where you can see a Gatling gun. The next question is where can we go to see a Gatling gun in action? Well, if we want to see a Gatling gun in action, there's only one place to go. We go to the movies. There was actually a movie made called The Gatling Gun. It is a B movie, but it is a rootin' tootin' shootin' western movie. Firing 600 rounds a minute, how economical of ammunition. Each and every Indian dispatched by that Gatling Gun was struck by one and only one bullet. <laughs> and the horses, not a single horse was even so much as grazed by a bullet. Now don't you just gotta love Hollywood. Now before we go to Dr. Gatling and his gun, let's look at a few of the antecedents of the Gatling gun and other attempts to make weapons of increased firepower. The Williams Rapid Fire Gun, made by the Confederates and used quite effectively in the Battle of Seven Pines in 1861. It fired a one pound projectile with a range of 2,000 yards, well over a mile, at a rate of 65 rounds a minute, a formidable weapon. But there were some problems. The single barrel with uh, rapid firing quickly overheated and jammed. It required a crew of three men to operate the gun and the crew member responsible for feeding in the paper cartridges at a rate of 65 rounds a minute often lost two or three fingers. So they soon ran out of volunteers for that position. Another try, the Vandenberg Volley Gun, one nasty gun. Invented by northern, a northern general, General Vandenberg of the New York State Militia. He tried to sell it to the English, but they weren't buying. So although he was a northern general, he sold it to the south. Had 85 bores, firing 50 caliber uh, ammunition, and when fired, all 85 bores went off at once. 
one really nasty gun. Now let's meet Richard Jordan Gatling. He was actually a Southerner, born on a plantation in North Carolina, where he worked with his father, inventing uh, machinery to make the arduous labor of uh, farming less labor intensive. Richard himself invented a wheat drill, which in the course of time made him a very wealthy man. He did attend medical school and he graduated, so he's certainly entitled to be called doctor but he gave up all thoughts of a career in medicine and continued a lifetime as an inventor. He invented a steam-driven plow in 1857, but this didn't sell well, uh, very likely because in 1857 there was a Great Depression and farmers just didn't have the kind of money needed to buy expensive machinery. And then in 1862, his most famous and successful invention, the Gatling Gun. He formed the Gatling Gun Company in Indianapolis, and many years later merged with the Colt Firearms Company in Hartford. In 1903, he passed away in New York City at the age of 85, very nearly a broken man, having dissipated a great fortune in bad real estate investments. Now, why did he invent the Gatling gun? Actually, his friends called him a hypocrite because he was known for his pacifist views and also because he had expressed sympathy for the Southern cause. Let's look to his own words as to why he invented the Gatling gun. It occurred to me that if I could invent a machine gun that could by rapid fire enable one man to do as much duty as a hundred, it would supersede the need for large armies and consequently limit exposure to battle and disease. So there we have it. He invented the Gatling gun for humanitarian reasons. <laughs> as we have seen, Richard Jordan Gatling was a physician, and the medical profession is a proud tradition dating back 2,500 years to Hippocrates, the father of medicine. As ever in the entire 2,500 noble history of the medical profession, a single physician uh, devoted himself to inventing killing machines rather than dedicating himself to healing the sick and mending the maimed, as he is required by education and training to do. The answer is no, not a single physician but a whole parade of them. You will immediately recognize this instrument, the guillotine, invented by a French physician, Joseph Ignace Guillotin. The E was actually added to his name by a, an English writer for the London Times who wanted guillotine when he was composing a bit of doggerel to rhyme with killing machine. Dr. Guillotine uh, invented the machine because he thought it would be a more humane way of executing the condemned. It was, of course, used extensively in the French Revolution, taking off the heads of all of the nobility they could gather up and anyone else the Committee on the Revolution didn't like, such as Antoine Lavoisier. Anyone recognize that name? Yes, sir. Oxygen. Oxygen. Absolutely right. The discoverer of oxygen, along with Joseph Priestley in England and Carl Scheele in the Netherlands. He was the father of modern chemistry. Lavoisier improved gunpowder development realizing that finer grains burn more quickly and required 1,000 times more space than the original powder. So the result was cannonballs were now hurled 50% further than before. In the American Le Revolution, France shipped 1.7 million pounds of Lavoisier's improved gunpowder to America. We own part our successful American Revolution in America today to Lavoisier's contribution. British soldiers, feeling the effect of his gunpowder and those cannonballs, complained they could not get close enough to shoot the colonials before they themselves were blasted from their garters. <laughs> Moving right ahead into our own times, we have the lovely Dr. Jack Kevorkian. In the course of his wacko career, he assisted 120 people to commit suicide. His machine he called the Thanatron, simply from the two Greek words meaning death machine. He taunted the district attorney in Michigan all along the way to bring charges against him, and he did. And twice, a jury refused to convict him. But the ever so helpful Dr. Jack Kevorkian provided the very evidence that the district attorney needed. He had no hesitation in appearing on 60 Minutes on national television, and uh, with his last uh, patient or victim, uh, he showed his procedure. In 2002, uh, he was finally convicted, his last victim uh, was a young man with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. And when the time came, he was simply too weak to push the button. And the ever so helpful Dr. Kevorkian said, here, let me help you. He stepped forward on national television and he pushed the button. 
That was no longer assisted suicide, that was murder. And the jury sent him away, the judge sentenced him to 10 to 25 years, which promised to be the rest of his life in the penitentiary, but the last couple of years, a judge released him on parole. Now, if I were to ask who were the most notorious criminals of the last hundred years, surely Al Capone's name would be near the top of the lift, list. This is his mugshot on the way to the penitentiary in uh, Atlanta. Everybody knows pretty well what sent uh, Al Capone to the penitentiary. It was Fantastic. income tax, right. In the 1920s, uh, when uh, Congress enacted prohibition, Al Capone, recognizing that the nation had an insatiable thirst, stepped right up to provide for it. And he did it so efficiently, uh, his income in the 1920s and 30s reached $100 million a year, but he did not pay his taxes. Capone's uh, thugs and gangs rampaged through the streets of Chicago with such reckless abandon. This cartoon appeared in Chicago newspapers of the time. These Chicago terrorists are making us Russian terrorists look like a bunch of amateurs. <laughs> One of the memorable events that uh, Al Capone's gang brought us was the Valentine's Day massacre. Uh, Capone's men wearing uh, stolen police uniforms rounded up members of a rival gang and they lined them up against the wall of a garage. And the rival gang members thinking, well, this is just another routine police bust. Uh, they'll be taken down to the police station and booked. Their lawyers will have them back out on the streets in a few hours. So they're very cooperative. But then Capone's men reached in their bags and they pulled out not a Gatling gun, but the son of the Gatling gun, the Thompson submachine gun, Tommy guns, and they mowed them down. When the real cops arrived, uh, one of the gangsters was still alive and they ran over to him, it was Frank Guzman. And they kneeled down and said, Frankie, Frankie, who shot you? And Frank Guzman, uh, in true gangster style, bleeding from seven bullet holes said, nobody shot me. Well, who else makes our list of notorious criminals? John, John Dillinger, serial bank robber. Machine Gun Kelly, armed and dangerous. Well, these are not the gangsters I have in mind. The ones that I'm thinking of were known everywhere in the world. Everywhere in the world where movies were seen, you would recognize Edward G. Robinson, Little Caesar, see? Humphrey Bogart, looking very ominous. And of course, Jimmy Cagney. Remember, Jimmy Cagney finally cornered the squealer and he said, okay, a dirty rat, I'm gonna let you have it. And he reached in his gun and he pulled out a? Gat. A gat. <laughs> Got somebody here with all the answers. A gat. They tell us that term for gatling, a uh, gat is derived from the gatling gun. Seems a long stretch to me, but who am I to argue with the authorities? Well, here's another scene from the movies familiar to all of us, the wagon train. This one stretches as far as the eye can see. This wagon train was heading west, west to Montana, very, very, very warm reception was being prepared for it by Chief Sitting Bull and, of course, Chief Crazy Horse. Question mark, because nobody really knows what Chief Crazy Horse looked like. Uh, this is an artist's conception of what he might have looked like. Chief Crazy Horse never allowed anyone to take his picture. He said whoever took his picture would be stealing his spirit. So, of course, we now know the leader of that wagon train was George Armstrong Custer. Here he is in western garb. Here he is in, in a little more regulation army uniform. You didn't know they had color film back in 1876, did you? <laughs> well, these are modern day reenactors. At the Battle of Little Bighorn, Custer and his men of the 7th Cavalry were wiped out by the Indians to the last man. After the battle, the Indians spoke with admiration of Custer. They called him Chief Yellowhair, and they admired his courage and bravery in battle. Thousands of Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors attacked his cavalry on the, at the Little Bighorn and killed every last one of them. Today, there are a few lonely statues in memory of George Armstrong Custer. In Monroe, Michigan, where he grew up, at Gettysburg, of course, and at West Point, where his remains were removed from the battlefield at the Little Bighorn. Although, can we be sure those were the remains of George Armstrong Custer and not of some other soldier in the 7th Cavalry, possibly even of an Indian? But, in honor of Chief Crazy Horse, today, a huge monument is arising in the hills of, uh, Black Hills of South Dakota. This beautiful alabaster statue you see in the foreground is only the model. 
the uh, real memorial is in the distance in this mountain where the plateau will be his outstretched arm. Close up of the head as it's taking shape. A torchlight procession on the anniversary of the Battle of the Little Bighorn. To the victor goes the glory, to the victor go the spoils. Today the Indians are having the last laugh, reaping millions of dollars every day from the white man in their gambling casinos. If you visit uh, North Dakota today and you go to that uh, fork of land between the Bighorn and Little Bighorn rivers and stand before this monument, if you are very quiet and listen to the wind, you can still hear the echoes of that battle long ago. Now to the Civil War. General Benjamin Butler, a wealthy lawyer from the state of Massachusetts. He bought 12 Gatling guns at $1,000 each, paying for them entirely out of his own pocket and they put them to use in the siege before Petersburg in 1864, and they were considered successful. Gatling was a witness. He said Butler fired the Gatling guns himself, causing great consternation and slaughter of the rebels. News of them went all over the world, and there ends the entire story of the use of the Gatling gun in the Civil War. Now this is pretty astonishing. Here's a weapon that could have brought a quick end to the war and yet it completely fades from you. How could that be? What possible explanation could there be? Well, I found the answer. You remember uh, Robert Ripley's Believe It or Not that used to be a regular feature of our Sunday funny papers? Well, I found the answer not with Robert Ripley, but with General James Wolfe Ripley. He was a graduate of West Point, a Lieutenant Colonel of Ordnance, a veteran with 47 years of service in the United States Army. With the outbreak of war, he was promoted to full colonel and named Chief of Ordnance. He brought order to a department bogged down in red tape. He labored to standardize weapons and ammunition, all to the good. Unfortunately, there was a downside to General uh, Ripley's character as well. He was rude with subordinates and businessmen, and resistant to new ideas, habitually uh, snubbing inventors even when their offerings had merit. No, says the king, send that crazy salesman away. I can't be bothered with some crackpot invention called a Gatling gun. I got a battle to fight. I've got to make sure my men have enough bows and arrows and their spears are sharpened. Well, that was the attitude of General James Wolfe Ripley. In 1860, the Henry repeating rifle had been patented. They were so effective, Union soldiers often bought their own rifles that they only cost $42. It fired at a rate of 28 rounds a minute. When the Confederates captured these rifles, they said that deadly 16-shooter, it was that damned Yankee rifle that they load on Sunday and shoot all week. They were made in abundance. Gatling's partner, Mr. Ringe, visited General Ripley and reported the chief of ordnance was an old fogey. He received my partner coldly, telling him he had no faith in his gun and that he believed flintlock muskets were on the whole the best weapons for warfare. A statement of such stunning obstinacy, it simply leaves one speechless. Gatling said, Ripley was a cantankerous fool who always backed the wrong horses, narrow-minded, dull, and just plain stupid. It's hard to argue with that opinion. A few other tries. Here's the Ager gun, quickly dubbed the coffee mill gun, for the uh, hopper into which ammunition was fed. But uh, again, with a single barrel, rapid firing caused it to overheat and jam. So a spare barrel was always provided, but changing a red-hot rifle uh, barrel in the midst of a battle was not a very efficient way to fight. Another try, invented by a Rochester, New York dentist, another member of the healing arts. 25 barrels, uh, loaded by inserting a tray of cartridges in the rear, followed by a tray of powder, and fired by pulling a lanyard when all 25 barrels went off in rapid succession making a ripping sound. Called the Billingshurst Requiem Battery after the Billingshurst Armory in Rochester, New York where the guns were made. Uh, several different types of rapid firing weapons were designed and produced during the Civil War, but few saw much actual service. Now well, here's one that surprised me. What year was the first machine gun invented? Anyone know or anyone want to take a guess? Any wild guesses? Anything's open. No guesses? 1825. 1825, okay. 
pretty good guess, not, uh, not unreasonable. Surprise answer is Leonardo da Vinci in the 1400s uh, designed a multi-barrel machine gun. These were his drawings. This is an actual model of the Leonardo da Vinci machine gun. 11 barrels, they were fired, then they rotated, and the next 11 barrels came into play. Uh, this is a, looks clearly to me like a modern uh, a device, uh, and I have no record that the da Vinci design was ever put into battle use. Here's another try, the Puckle gun invented by James Puckle, a lawyer in London, England. So members of the bar come in for their, shame of the, their share of the credit or blame. His idea that this would be a revolving cylinder, and if you were fighting Christian enemies, it would fire round bullets. But if you were firing, firing, uh, fighting Muslim enemies, you would switch to this cylinder, which fired square bullets because they would hurt more and do more damage. The British Army, however, was not buying. Now here's a gun everybody will recognize, the six-shooter, a handheld gun with a rotating cylinder holding six bullets that could be fired as fast as you could pull the trigger. So if he could make a handheld gun with a rotating cylinder, why not a cannon with a rotating cylinder? Well, why not? The Confederates made one. They actually uh, it fired uh, a four-pound projectile, had a five-shot cylinder. In a test firing, the first gun blew up, killing three Confederate crew members. The second gun was promptly shipped off to the Siege Museum in Petersburg, Virginia, and can be seen there to this very day. There's another try. We have double-barreled shotguns, why not a double-barreled cannon? This was an idea of a private in Athens, Georgia. His idea was you would fire two cannonballs, they would be linked by a chain, and when fired at the enemy, they would cut through a field of enemy soldiers like a scythe cutting through a wheat field. Problem was, they could never get the two barrels to fire at the exact same instant, so invariably the chain broke, the cannonballs went whizzing through the air, chains flailing about in every which direction, cutting down all the Confederates along the way. So back to the drawing board. Well, finally, the Gatling gun came into effective use. It won't surprise you to uh, learn that uh, Gatling Parker, Lieutenant John Parker, wrote the manual on the use of Gatling guns after the uh, Spanish-American War, and eventually he rose through, through the ranks and made general. Uh, this is an artist's conception how the Gatling gun might have been made mobile, but uh, they tell me this is highly unlikely. The camel is a very obstinate beast and not very... Uh, 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 receptive to having a Gatling gun fired from top his back. Gatling guns today are found on naval vessels throughout the world. In World War II, the United States honored Richard Yorton Gatling, naming a destroyer after him. They're used today on our aircraft carriers. I thought this was an appropriate choice of our aircraft carriers for a Civil War presentation. On aircraft carriers, Gatling guns are strategically placed at each corner of the vessel and now fired electrically rather than by hand cranks send forth a stream of bullets at a rate of 6,000 rounds a minute reaching one to two miles into the sky forming what uh, basically becomes a solid lead pipe. No enemy aircraft or missile flying through that lead pipe can fail to be disintegrated. They're used in our uh, military aircraft. Uh, this is the A-10 Thunderbolt quickly dubbed the Warthog for its ungainly appearance but beloved by the American infantry. In Afghanistan, an American sergeant uh, with a convoy of six vehicles was trapped in a box canyon taking heavy fire from the Taliban. He took shelter behind a two-foot rock, which was quickly whittled down to a one-foot rock. The sergeant radioed for an airstrike. A warthog soon appeared. The American sergeant set off a smoke grenade to show his position, and the warthog began firing on the enemy Taliban positions with immediate telling effect. They waved a white flag, sent out six Afghan prisoners that had been fighting with the Americans, and a message if they would call off the airstrike, they would release their other six prisoners. The sergeant uh, radioed the uh, warthog and said, Captain, I know this may be sudden, but I think I love you. <laughs> Look at the size of that Gatling gun. Here it completely overshadows a Volkswagen Beetle. Look at the size of the ammunition fired by the Gatling gun. A 30 millimeter round contrasts with the 16, the rounds fired by our F-16 fighter jets. That round weighs two pounds, made of depleted uranium that can penetrate the most hardened military armor. Let's see the Warthog in action. <laughs> Look.
Lord Byron, revered British poet, wrote, We live in an age of new invention, for killing bodies and for saving souls, all propagated with the best intentions. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching Peninsula Senior Lecture Series. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.